Okay, I think we should be we should be here at this point. Um, presumably, you can hear me, so maybe let me let me know if you can. That would be great. Um, the inexplicable reason from Paul might be because there could be some problems on my end, but I hope you can hear me now. Um, yeah, maybe give me a shout. Ah, great, good, good, good. Okay. Thank you. Thanks for coming. It's great to have you here. Um, I know there was a, a, a lab earlier this morning and it's just finished. So some of you may not actually be making this live um, because you could be exhausted um, from the effort. There was great energy in the lab this morning. So it's nice to see it. And, uh, and um, let's bring that to the lecture as well. So as I said before, please give me a shout with questions if you want during the stream. I will probably won't have time to text replies, but I'll, I'll answer them if I can. And um, let's go straight into the lecture. OK, so today's lecture then in CS230, Web Information Processing, is presenting content with cascading style sheets. And I can see from wandering around the lab this morning that people were people were doing great work already. And, you know, you're doing some references, checking up some of the links that were in the assignment document and generally you know making great effort so it's good to see so i guess most of the stuff i'll be telling you a little bit about this morning will be will be um some of the more theoretical aspects of css as opposed to some of the practical stuff so if we work down through the assignments you'll see the first assignment is here um, and people have started working on this already it's available for you it's available for you now and really, uh, um, it's a nice assignment where you've got to build a food pyramid, but it relies heavily on doing some work with CSS. And, you know, in order to make it work, there are some nice links here um, on, on CSS and some examples that you can use and, and, and work as a basis for your, own, for your own assignments. Now, I'm pretty good with you using stuff from material from W3 schools or from the links that we give you. And any source, you know, as long as you're not copying and pasting straight code without changes for the major work of an assignment, then that's okay. So I'm happy enough with that. Um, if I give code, you can use my code as well. So that's good. I just wanted to let you know in advance of this. Um, so the lab, um, somebody asked a question there. Um, it's downstairs in Olus, you know, so it's the last three labs, the big, big one, and it'll be there. Um, all this, I think I posted a link on Teams as well for you, so you should be able to have a look there. Okay, let's get back to the class. So we're going to look at this um, CSS cascading style sheets today. And um, really, uh, we're into the second week. And CSS stands, as I've said already, cascading style sheets. And they describe how HTML elements are to be displayed on screen, paper, or other media. Okay? The CSS saves you an awful lot of work. It controls the layout of multiple web pages all at once. And these styles can be dynamically applied using very simple commands. Great demo of dynamic style changes on the CSS homepage, if you want to have a look and see that. Let's maybe go and have a peek. Um, I think I have, I have too many browsers open, but we'll have a look. Here's W3 Schools. Let's go to the homepage. And I think you can, you can change the styles here very easily um, by, by manipulating these things here. So, so you can generally change the style and the layouts and so forth yourself, you know, for accessibility purposes. So you can have a look at that yourself too. Okay. It saves a lot of work for you and you can save your styles and files that are dynamically and dynamically select whichever one you want at any one time. You might want to do a page, a section of a page, a complete website based on your preferences. You might have accessibility issues, accessibility styles. You may have like dark themes, for example, or day themes, or, you know, people just might like, you know, to have their own preferred styles. I have some set up for using, um, uh, Safari, which is my preferred browser, you know, I have some style sheets that I use because, um, you know, I, I have difficulty seeing um, small texts and small fonts. So, you know, I make sure that all website styles are overridden with my styles so that I'm able to use fonts that I can read. And then also the color, I have diff difficulties with color and brightness and so forth as well, because I have some blindness in, one, in, in my left eye, and it means I need to make some adjustments. So I can have these general styles that I can embed in my browser that I can apply to all sites everywhere. So it's nice and, and it's really useful. And remember, styling is about the presentation, not the structuring of the content. Last week we looked at HTML and we could see about structure, and this time it's all about the style. Okay? And next week we'll be looking at interactivity, and that's why we look at some JavaScript. So there are three main ways to look at using and dealing with style. Okay, you have internal, external, and inline. An inline CSS 
It's just the first method that we use, and we can put that directly into our HTML elements. So some structuring elements with HTML, we can use the style attribute on that and provide properties to it. Some list of um, list of um, elements here, like color blue, and we can have multiple ones as well. We could have font size, whatever you want here, and um, we could have all sorts of stuff in between these two quotes and separated by semicolons. And this is a, a style for this tag, and it's just an inline style. We can have some internal CSS. That's where in the header section of our document, we have a style section here. And here we're saying that H1, all H1 elements, you know, will have the color blue. So it's useful, and that's often called just internal styling. And then we have some external CSS or external styling. And that's the most recommended way, generally, where you use an external style sheet. And we create a style sheet with this .css extension. And we add the style sheet using a link element to our document. Then we can add all of the styles or all of our CSS into that separate style sheet that's very easy to maintain. So you know, we just have a, a link here to this style sheet here, a relative link. And then we have some, you know, we, we tell it uh, file name, I'm just calling it style.css. And then, you know, inside style.css, we will have this h1 color blue. So we're essentially doing all, we're making sure that all h1 elements are, are blue in three different ways. Okay. And that's a nice approach to do this. Sometimes you want to use all three. Generally, this top one is a bad way to do and not to do this. And um, but we, we might want to override what's in um, a file. For so something that I often ask in an exam or I ask students, you know, to, to try to understand and why we give kind of lectures on this stuff as opposed to the, the theory, I guess, is we often need to know in this situation where we have all of these three styles in the same program or the same document, which one gets applied? So let's say the color was red here and the color was green here and the color was blue here for H1 elements. And, you know, we have a, we do something, which one gets applied? So that's a useful thing to know and understanding, you know, the ordering of styling. Okay, we need to know, okay, it's pretty obvious, you know, the local one, the local one here, this one happens first, is our base one, we override it with this, depending on where the, 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 these two, the link and the style section occurs in the, in the document. But, you know, this one is a local, inline applied and it will probably override everything else. So, you know, but you need to, but there are rules for this and there are more complicated things you can do with CSS. And that's why we want to be able to know and understand the ordering of applying styles. So as we talk about the cascade in a way, okay. And that cascade then comes from the specified priority scheme that you will use to determine which rule applies if more than one rule matches a particular element. And this cascading priority scheme is predictable. You should be able to tell it and you should be able to do this and understand and, and understand it. So styles are read in, in three ways. The browser defaults, the style sheets, that's the internal head or the external ones via import or link, and then the inline styles. And the default priority order is browser default, default external, internal, inline. But if two rules have the same weight, the latter definition wins priority. So imported style sheets and internal style sheets uh, um, actually carry the same weight. But since the imported style sheets are considered to be before any rules in the style sheet itself, the latter will win. In other words, the internal. So you need to do a little bit about, you need to do a little bit about sometimes debugging to see, well, why am I not getting the style that I want applied here? And this becomes an issue as well when you're using other third party style sheets that are templates that you want to be able to use, you know, in your application. And then you might want to override some of those or you might like, you know, you might like to Two different styles so it becomes a problem and um and if you're looking at styles that are dealing with shapes and so forth sometimes the shaping and manipulation doesn't work as you would expect and usually it comes down to the cascade so in terms of the rule priority in this cascade then it comes from the specified priority scheme to determine which rule applies if more than one rule matches the particular element okay and um so that's just worthwhile remembering that Let's have another little think about rule priority. And I know some of you have been using rules because I've been in the lab and having a look and it's great um, to see you looking at making triangles and um, trapezoids and so forth. But it isn't always the case. If you have multiple style tags inside your head document and the second one say uses an import rule to, to import an external style sheet, there are all sorts of validity rules been broken. 
So for example, using an import after and an internal style sheet when imports could be loaded first. And there's a good thing to know about is that, you know, there are rules that you can have a look at. And if you click through here um, to this document, you'll see um, there's a really, really good um, article on don't use import or at import. Really, really good article here. I like it a lot. Worthwhile reading. And, you know, he's talking about high performance websites and when you shouldn't use link, when you should use link and imports and so forth. Worthwhile reading and having a, having a chance, um, if you have a chance at some point to see this. You'll notice if you go back up through the, through the list, I gave you some examples. I didn't actually mention at import here, but I mentioned it in passing here. And you may be thinking, if you're catching up and keeping up with the lecture, well, why didn't he tell us about export? Because I don't really like it. And um, I'd like you to have a look at the link again that's here in order to be able to see why. Okay, link is always preferable, okay. And the latter blocks parallel downloads. Import, uh, import blocks parallel downloads. That means the browser will have to wait for some file to import, you know, and then finish importing before it moves on to the next one. And this is real sort. There's also the problematic when you've got lots of bad imports. So, you know, using link, infinitely better. So, it's, you know, it's just a tip and it's worthwhile looking at and using. So, let's learn a little bit now about CSS selectors. Okay, so selectors are used to find or select the elements that you want to style. We don't want situations, people, where, you know, we have to style every single element. Okay? Generally, we style classes of elements. Okay? So we build classes of elements, and then we give styles to those classes. And we can say that a particular group of elements belong to a particular class, for example. So we can find selectors then to select maybe a tag, select a class, collect, select an, a unique element, um, and, and then we apply style to that. So, but there are five categories really that we need to know about and think about. Okay, so the five categories are simple selectors. Okay, simple select. So they, that means you can select an element based on the name, the ID, or this class. And we'll see a little bit more about these numbers. Combinator selectors, they select elements that are based on a relationship between two elements. We can have pseudo class elements. And that selects elements based on some certain state. Pseudo elements select and style part of an element. That might be something that you might not think about, but you can select parts. For example, you might have an element on a page and there might be a space before that element and a space after that element. That's still the element, which you might want to style the space after or the space before. Interesting. And you can have attribute selectors. And these are the, these select elements based on a particular attribute or a particular attribute value. So there's lots of examples of these categories. I'm going to use, again, the w3schools.com for a lot of information on that. For, for the examples here, and you know, if you go to the w3schools.com, select tutorials in the top here, there's a learn CSS, and you can click on learn CSS, and it's a great CSS tutorial. And you can work through this, and as before, you, know, you can look at an example, you can try the example yourself, you can make changes to the example, and you can change the background color, for example, here. Here's a, a you know, a style applied to the body in the style section of the head of this document. And you might want, instead of having the, the color here being blue, light blue, you might want to make it blue. Run it, you'll see that it changes here. So this nice interactive work is good for you. Um, you can, or if you want, you can make your own you can work in your own um, browser or your own um, editor. You can copy this here, for example, which is what I'm doing. Um, I'm heading over to Visual Studio Code. And I'll create a new file here. And I'll just add this in here. And it knows it's HTML. It's you know, figured this out already. And I can run and um, look at my command palette. And I can preview this side. And I've got this. Or I can, you know, I can save this file. Save this file here to. I'll just save the file. Oh, sorry. I'm going to save it to my class table. 
fastdemo.html, for example. And I'm saving this, and then I can maybe open Google Chrome, open the file that I just created. And you know, this is the work here. Okay, and of course, I could use JS Fiddle as I, or Code Pen as I mentioned before, and it's worthwhile worthwhile doing this. So, lots of ways of playing and working with examples and playing with CSS. And um, I may have a look at the, the, the chat to see if there's anything. Hmm, what selectors we need to know? We need to know all those selectors. Some message there. Um, the uh, that's very very blue. It's very very blue. That's why we use light blue <laughs> most of the time. Okay. And um, there's a question about the lab. Um, somebody asked in chat there. If you can just look at Teams, all the all the questions have most of these questions have been asked already, and I answered them in Teams. So maybe check the Teams chat, and you'll be able to have a look at them. But it's in the oldest building, and it'll give you some details there. So I noticed actually in passing that let me just go to uh, to JS Fiddle for a second. Have a look at JS Fiddle here, this code playground. And I noticed people were doing some, some, some work in JS Fiddle for the lab this morning, which is, which is fine. Um, let's take the program that we were looking at in JS Code. Let's, so we take, the, we take the styles from here, copy them from here, and let's go into our CSS. We put them in here. We don't need the style tag, actually, because it knows it's a CSS style. Okay, there's a style tag here, so that's good. And now let's have a look at what else is in this code here. Um, okay, so here's the body and the paragraph. Have a look and place that into our HTML section here. So with the HTML, in the HTML section, CSS, in the CSS section, we have no JavaScript for this, for example, here. We can click up here on the, and run it, and we should get a very blue, a very, very blue background for me, which we will, wait, and you know, it, it's working as we would expect here as well. Okay. Now, if you're working on an assignment in JS Fiddle, and I prefer if you were working in VS Code or something else, but you know, sometimes people work in JS Fiddle, then if you want to save this, you know, you can save it to your web, but if you also might want to export it, okay, so you're going to have to find a way to export this and make sure that you have a version that runs locally. Because if we can't run your program that you submit as an assignment, we won't be able to run it and correct it. So you have to find a way to make sure how to do this. And um, I could probably find a link I gave to students last year, but that was a big problem that people had at one point is that they were, they were um, working in an online playground and then they tried to export it and it didn't work. And the problem is they didn't actually test it. You know? So when you download it, test it, you can load it up in a browser because that's how we do the correction of your assignments. And um, you have to be very careful. Um, we won't correct the fiddle. Okay, we won't go to the online fiddle. We'll only correct the downloaded version that's, that's zipped up and then submitted to. Okay, but the, the demonstrator, lab demonstrator will help, Melat will help you with that a little bit later. Let's get back to class. Any questions on that, by the way? Sorry? Okay, no, no questions. Okay, we're, we're doing good, okay. Okay, so the element selector selects the HTML elements that's based on the element's name. So if you can set the style of the paragraphs, as we have a look over here, you'll see that the P element here has a text alignment of, that's centered, and we can have a color blue. And it will tell you that the text is blue, okay? And, um, and it's centered. That's selecting the element, and the element is P here. Notice that we don't need the tags, the, the, the angle brackets around this. Okay? We just need to know the element. Okay? Um, we could, we could, um, we could play with this. Let, let's play with this first. The back up. Let me just copy this piece of text and show you something you can. Okay, so I copy this element selector here and I'll go to my VS code and work with VS code. Um, actually, I'll do something different. I'll go into the playground. Okay, so will I find something good? Okay. okay, so I have my paragraph here and here's my paragraph. Um, so the font family is, is here. We want to make the color um, the back to have a look at our, we want to make the color blue, but we'll make it pink here. Let's run this. And our, we have a nice pink text on this blue paragraph here. So we've seen this, okay. Now, if I actually look here and I have a, let's create a div element. 
But let's create a H2 element. Let's change this to header 2. Change this to be H2. You can see I've, I've got another. This is another paragraph. So it's a heading. You know what? I'm, I'm, I'm making a change at heading. Let's run this. And here we have a heading. So you can see that the style only applies to this paragraph. But we could actually add a comma in here and say this also applies to H2. So we can you know, select this tag as well. We can select the H2 and the P and apply the same font to each, same style to each of them. And we come on, and now we have this. But H2 has a, a different um, wit font weighting you can see here because it's a header. So there's some bolding going on in the background for H2. So there's a difference between a paragraph and a heading that we are not controlling as part of the styling here. So it's worthwhile knowing this. Okay, let's go back to our. So oh, yeah, so we're selecting the element here. Okay. The ID selector, um, uh, the ID selector is uh, uses the ID attribute of an element to select that specific or unique element. And the ID of the element should be unique within a page. That's what I mean. We select a unique element, and so to select an element with a specified ID, you use the hash character followed by the ID of the element. You don't include a hash when you're using the selector on a specific tag. Okay, so here we have a paragraph here, and now we're we're, we're creating this style hash para one, and we're saying any style, okay, any ID or that has that particular ID will have centered and red text. So we can say an ID para one has that red. So we can override any previous paragraph elements, selections that have been set here. Useful to see this and you might like to try it. And again, you know, you can go to somewhere like VS Code, you can go to an online playground and you can play with some of the rules. Okay. Um, somebody asked a question about commenting the code. Uh, generally, you might need to put some comments. You'll see I sometimes, as we move on and we have more, more um, more complicated setups, we might want to comment the HTML code. I almost always comment the JavaScript code. I sometimes comment the CSS code because I need to know why I'm doing something in a particular way. The HTML should be fairly obvious, um, but it depends. You know, you may you may be doing something unique with a unique tag, you know, um, that's out of the ordinary or unexpected or something, or you might have forms that you might want to comment. Um, and so forth. So yeah, it's a good idea to get into doing it, but not excessively, um, especially not now. Okay. Yeah, not a bad idea to understand how it's structured. Good question. Good question. So apart from selecting a specific ID, we can select a class. And a class selects elements with a specific class attribute. And so to select elements with a specific class, write a dot character in front of the class name. So we can look at dot center here, for example, would be a class that we're, we're choosing. And we're saying anything that has dot center will be text aligned and have the color green. And then you can apply, uh, uh, you might have, you might say that I'm specifically saying centers, center class on, <coughs> on P elements or paragraph elements, you know, will be text aligned center and green as well. There's lots of ways you can do that. And then I can choose my class here. Say the class is center, this will be green. If I use span and I'd say it's green. So we're, we're not applying it to a specific tag, specific element. We're not supplying it to a specific individual element, you know, which is identified uniquely. Um, we're specifying it to a class of element. And so you can apply the class to any element or restrict the, um, the usage to a specific element. You know, if we want the first class selection rule to, to do the P and the span, and both elements, they'll be centered in green. If we use the second rule, then only the, the P will have that style. So what happens then if we include both rules? This is what you need to try to figure out. Okay. I know my spelling is terrible, hegging. <laughs> but anyway, um, I think we get there in the end. Okay, so we start to move on a little bit then. And you saw some, you saw me do something earlier where I just separated some elements um, that were applying, which was the, with a comma, and that's a grouping selector. So the comma is a grouping selector, and that allows us to select all the HTML elements with the same style definition. So in CSS code, the H1, H2, and P, all of the same style definition. Then if we have a universal rule that selects every element in the document and applies a rule to it. 
And if we use the second rule, then only the P will have that style. Here's a P. So what happens if we include both rules? And it's important that you have some sense of understanding um, the rules for CSS. Because when I, when I, um, I will ask questions like this in, in, in my exam. You know? um, I might give you something and then a bunch of CSS and say, well, what happens? You know, can we include both these rules? You need to know how that works. So you need to understand the rules. And you may or may not have access to a computer to be able to. But you probably will. In general, sometimes you need to know how the rules work. We have something called a combinator. And that's something that explains the relationship between selectors. But here we have div and p, okay? And this tells us about descendants. And it tells us that you can contain more than one, can, one selector. So between the simple selectors, we can have combinators. There are four combinators, okay, four of them. We have descendants, which we've got a space between the two. Then we have a child where we have um, a greater than. We have an adjacent sibling selector, which is a plus. And we have a general sibling selector, which is a tilt. So all of those define how tags relate to each other, whether you're a descendant tag, a child tag, an adjacent tag, or just a general sibling tag. And that might be the case where you have um, a P tag inside a div tag, for example. Um, you might have a P tag immediately followed by, sorry, a div tag immediately followed by a P tag and then it would apply to that one and not to all p that are in the div. So you need to try and play with these. So the descendant selector, and that matches all the elements that are descended of a specific tag. So this um, selects all p elements that are inside the div elements. The child selector, this one here, selects all elements that are the children of a specified element. So it selects all the p elements that are children of a div element. The adjacent sibling selector, that selects all elements that are adjacent. That means it immediately follows the siblings of a specified element. So sibling elements have to have the same parent. So for example, it selects all p elements that are placed immediately after div elements. And the general sibling selector selects all elements that are siblings of a specified element. So this example here then selects all p elements that are sibling um, of the div elements. I know I see you in the lab using and working with CSS and copying and pasting. You need to understand what you're doing and how you're doing it and why you're doing it and how these things work. When you start to write something yourself, understand how it works. These rules are crucial. Understanding combinations. Please, please learn them if you want. Okay, so um, any questions there before I move on to the next section? Quick drink while you're thinking about that. Nope. Okay. Let's now look at some of the hard stuff. And hard stuff is the good stuff, and you can do good things with it. And if you're starting at looking at making triangles and so forth, you know, um, and shapes, you will see that, you know, it relies heavily on pseudo classes and pseudo elements. Okay. A sibling. Is something that's on the same level. It's a child. It's a, essentially, it's a a, a sibling is like your brother and a brother or a sister. You're at the same level in the document. So, um, a child is the level below. Thanks, Wang. Good question. Let's have a look at pseudo elements. So, a pseudo class is used to define a special state of an element. So for example, it can be used to style an element when a user mouses over an element. So like I'm mousing over here, what happens when I mouse over the word tabbing? Okay, for example, um, that's something called hovering. Um, it could look at style visited and unvisited links differently. So references to history and the state. It style an element when it gets focused, when you click or tab something. So you might have a, a, a pseudo class here. So we can say that a link for the anchor tag has a particular color for an unvisited link. If it's a visited link, we change the color here. If it's a hover, we change it to this color. And if it's an active link, we change it to this. 
And we can combine, um, generally these are set up by having the selector, its pseudo class, and the property value. And the pseudo classes can be combined with CSS classes. So you might have an A dot highlight colon hover. Okay, so there's a, a highlight is the class, hover is the pseudo class, and we're telling it that the background color will be yellow. Something like this. So we have a paragraph, and inside that we have an anchor tag, and the class is highlight. And then when we hover or click here, you know, we can apply this particular. So this is nice. So this is the, these are pseudo classes. And again, they can be used on their own link. This is it. Hover active. Or you may have um you may have them combined with with just regular CSS class. Okay, there are many CSS pseudo classes. There's a nice list here with examples under w3schools.com pseudo classes reference. You can click through to have a look and it won't find it. <laughs> um I will here and I'll speak if I can. I must have put the wrong link in. See a selectors online. Go, oh, this is what we want. So here are the pseudo classes. And we can see the various examples of these, and you can see examples, and you can work through and play with these if you want. So this is a, a nice tooltip example. Look at this one. Looks good. Okay, so I'll hover over the element to show the show one other element. No CSS. Sorry, no JavaScript, just all pure CSS. And we have the hover and we're having the pseudo elements. Pseudo class. Really important. Pseudo class. So for example, if we look at this one. We have a style that we're created here that says the paragraph and an I for um, uh, usually this is the I tag, it's a strong, we use it for strong, it used to be italicized. And okay? um, make sure that if it's the first, the first italicized, and we make it a color. So here we have a paragraph. Let's look at this. You see this here? I am a strong person. I'm a strong person. Paragraph. I am a strong person. I am a strong person, and in both cases, the strong is wrapped within an I tag. We're telling it here as part of the rule that it's only the first child gets the style, not the second or, for, or subsequent. In this one here, we have I am a strong person, I am a strong person. Again, it's the first child because that's the rule that we applied here. For the for colon first child to work, you have to have a doc type, by the way, in some, some um, Internet Explorer browser. So, you know, we have lots of control over how these things work. And this matters for layout sometimes. Pseudo class names are not case sensitive. Um, note the comment. We can have comments here. And somebody did ask a question, a good question about commenting earlier. It's not a bad idea to actually have comments when you're doing something interesting um, like this. Um, so um, we're in a CSS3 era, so the older browsers may have some issues rendering this, but I suspect that many of you will, will work with, so if you're using Windows, you'll use Edge, or you use Chrome, I use Safari. Um, you can see that we have uh, Vivaldi, Firefox, and Opera, there will be others. You know, you may, use, you may be building for Silk on a, on a Fire tablet or something. But it's, um, it's useful. Okay, so you need to have a sense of how these things all together and how they work, understanding what this means. And, and actually, it's a it's a worth a point worth, worth making and looking at. This. It's always always possible to just copy and paste into a browser and see what it does. And I'm you know, but as web developers, and you know, and and it's easy to see and say, oh yeah, that's what it does. But you need to know why it does it this way. Why is this rule applied? Why does this make this happen? There's a difference then in terms of, you know, knowing. You can see the difference. Seeing is seeing what the result is, but knowing how it works is really important. And with web dev, it's all very easy to just copy and paste, push it into a browser, run it, and see, see what happens. 
But knowing why it's happening is actually really crucial to your understanding of the topic. So I want you to know why things work, not just to be able to show me and let me see how things work. Because if I said to you, no, I don't actually want it to work that way. I want it to work a different way. Then seeing, I don't want you going into an editor and typing all sorts of combinations just to try to find the one that gives the result. Knowing the rules and understanding the rules of CSS selection will allow you to actually be able to produce something in one shot. That's really important, really important. So a pseudo element then is used to style specific parts of an element. So it can be used to style the first letter for a, of a line, for example, um, insert content before or after the content of the element. So the general rule here for this is we have a selector, we choose a pseudo element, and then what the property value is. So if we, for example, could say in a paragraph, we have the first letter has this color and has this very large font size. That's a rule. Nice rule. Go back up to the rule up here. Maybe up to the rule. Oh gosh. Okay, let me just copy this and see if we can make this work. Let's take this pseudo element. Copy. Let's go to where did I put JS Fiddle? Okay, here. Let's see what happens here. I do this. First letter has to be a different color and has to be this large. Let's run it and see what happens. Move writing. Okay. Take this one. Font size, not great there. I can't really see it with the font, okay. This didn't work very well. Um, I'll come back to this. I'll do it for you again. I don't want to delay things which possible. But you should be able to copy and paste these directly into your browser and it will work for you. I'm not sure why it's not. So let's have a look then at the next pseudo element here, which is the, um, the first line pseudo element. That adds a line to the first line of text. This one, for example, formats the first line of the text in all paragraph elements to be this color and to have these small caps. Pseudo elements have a value and the user select. So we use the double colon to select. Double colon to select. Okay. What's really interesting, and you'll see this with your, with your triangles and trapezoids that you may be using for your exercise, is that the before pseudo element, that inserts some content before the element. For example, this one inserts an image before the H1 element, and the after pseudo element inserts some content after the content of an element. So it does something before and after. Okay? There's a limited list of properties available for each of these. You could check online for those. What's important to realize is that you use a double colon replaces the single colon notation for pseudo elements in CSS3. Let's try to make a distinction between the pseudo classes and the pseudo elements. Okay? Um, the single colon was used for both, for both pseudo classes and pseudo elements in CSS2 and CSS1. It is accepted for backward compatibility, but do please remember to use the colon. Okay? There's also the content property, and you may have seen this before, okay, with the before and after pseudo elements in some of the examples. So here, for example, you know, it has a well-defined syntax, can be only used with pseudo elements, and it provides extra control of their contents arrangement. So we can talk about a list style here. We can change the style of a list. UL is an unordered list, okay? And we can say that the style is none, the padding, and so forth. That removes all the default bullets. And again, you can look at the W3 schools to get a full list, or you can look at the Mozilla Developer Network, it'll give a list of them as well. But it's worth perusing and having, having a look. A really nice example um, removes all the HTML bullets, replaces them with bullets, and that's just because you can. 
So this one here takes away all the bullets, but I'm telling you that the content will be a bullet and we can change the padding. But you know, we could do that. But we might not just want bullets, we might want square bullets, we might want some, some icon that we want to use. Okay. Let me just switch across so you can see this one, sorry. Um, so here we have changed the content in the list, an li. ul is an unordered list, li is just the list. And we say before each of the element contents, take away, replace the bullet with this bullet. But you could maybe have like a smiley face or you could have something like that or you know, any icon that you wanted. You could most useful to do that. We also might want to change the path. What's important is that, you know, and you'll see this a little bit later, is that you cannot dynamically give a pseudo class to an element with JavaScript. Okay. There's more than one way to do it though. And you can have a look at this example. So we often hear about this Tim Toady, which is there's more than one way to do it. Um, and if you check this example, it'll show you some fun things that you can do with, with this changing content. Very nice. A nice example that changes the content. You can have a look. I want to go back and look at rule priority before we finish up this class. This is a bit of the heavy, heavy duty stuff. Um, it's probably best read. <laughs> you know, it's not the most exciting to listen to, and certainly not the most exciting element to teach, but we do it anyway. Okay. So when we looked at the lecture, we talked about priorities and related default, the, you know, we saw default, eternal, external, and inline declarations of CSS. When multiple style sheets are used, the style sheets can be in conflict with each other. So in these situations, there must be other rules as to which style sheets rule will win. So these characteristics actually determine um, the outcome of contradictory style sheets. Important, the origin of the rules are the author's rules versus the reader's rules, the selector rules where we calculate specificity, and the order of specification. These are things that we need to know. So the rules can be designated as important by, by adding and uh, playing important to them. This style, for example, here tells us that this is important that we maintain and preserve this, style, this color. So if a style is designated as important, then it will, it will, um, it will win over contradictory styles of equal weight. Since both the author and the reader can specify different important rules, the author's rule will always override uh, the reader's in case of importance. Here's an example. Defining a rule with important attribute that discards the normal concerns as regards the latter rule overriding the early ones. So it's used for overriding the styles that are previously declared in other style sources in order to achieve a certain design. You wanna be careful and decide which one works, okay? Background color green is important. Um, we wouldn't do this. We generally would not have backgrounds as green um, because sometimes visited links are red and then people with, um, with uh, sex linked color blindness, for example, um, genetic blindness usually have difficulties trying to distinguish between red and green. So don't use green background. Certainly use, don't use red backgrounds with green. You just can't distinguish between, of them, between them. So you want to look for alternatives. So sometimes, you know, there's a way, this actually is counterintuitive. But there are reasons why we might want to have specific rules to make sure our interface, our user interface, our user experience is preserved. So the original use case and the reason important reasons exist is because of user style sheets. Okay. As I mentioned to you at the beginning that, um, of this lecture, I would have my own user style sheet so I could override the fonts to make sure that I can read those fonts. Okay. Um, so you have to be very careful with that. So you can easy to do it. Like with Safari, you can go to preferences and advanced style sheet. You can select one. And in your style sheet, you could do things like hide the comments, hide ads. It's how ad blockers work, for example, as well. You can do all sorts of fun things, you know, with your style sheets that override the exist, override the one that's presented from the author. Okay. So if you look at that CSS tricks website, you'll see some really nice things on how to use, um, are important, important. Because they apply to all websites, not specific websites, you'll have to write fairly generic selectors here that are most likely to apply to all sites like body. But a selector like for body that has very low specificity, likely to be beaten by a website's own styles. So important rules allow you, allow you to write generic selectors, but they still have the power to change things, authors. So, you know, you might think about how, how um, uh, ad blockers work for you, how people, like me, want to change to make text more readable. 
but I think um, if I go to here, can I go to careful where I go all the time? But um, let me see if I tried article W three. Just go to W three tools. This home for W tools code. So if I look here and my Safari browser, I have a reader version here. So what's happening here is that here's the here's the website in okay, the web page, got all sorts of structure, all sorts of presentations, all sorts of stuff here. I can apply this reader style essentially here that gives me a reader view. And what it does is it change it maintains the structure, but it changes it. So I'm still getting some content. But that's because I'm essentially applying a different style here. My reader style is being applied. Now, it's not great with this one here because it's highly stylized and set up, but, but actually, um, if it was with a newspaper article, then we could actually see it would be very useful to get rid of all the superfluous text and we could just focus on. There's a reason why we want to have these stylings. So there, there, this thing about which one you actually decide upon is called calculating specificity. So there's lots of descriptions on specificity available. They only regard three aspects resulting in descriptions like 001, 0001. And, and I use this as in the Mozilla, Mozilla Developer Guidelines. It's worthwhile maybe clicking through to have a look at this. Um, this is the Mozilla Developer Network, and it talks about how you can inherit styles. Actually, have a look at this. And you can see, you can read this, it looks nice. Again, I'm applying my style. So the browser has to, con has to calculate specificity. In other words, which rule does it choose? So an element selector has low specificity. It can be overwritten by a class. A value in points is awarded to each of the different types of selectors. Adding up the points gives you weight to a particular selector, and that can be assessed against other matches. And that's how we choose. So it would be worthwhile having a look at this slide in your own time, because this tells you a little bit about the rules that you can use to apply specificity. Okay, it's a bit tough, but it's worthwhile having a look. Okay, so basically we try to select an element based on on um, whether it's a, a user defined, whether it's a, an author defined, you know, and so forth. And we can figure out which rule gets selected in this. Okay, there's a full explanation of the table again here and here um, about attributes. I'm just including it here for you to have a look at in your own time at some point. But um, and certainly you could have a look at this article on Cascade and Inheritance and you'll see the rules around how we might specify one rule over another rule where we've got several of them together. And it's worthwhile. Having. And this table came from Mozilla. So Mozilla developer worthwhile having. It. Um, but anyway, if you get back to the rules, you know, both authors really, I suppose, for me, I want you to 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 know a couple of core things. Um, Authors and readers have the ability to specify smooth uh, style sheets. When the rules between the two conflict, the author's rules will win out over the reader's rules of otherwise equal weight. Okay? That may or may not be a way to do that. But authors can also be wary of using important rules because they'll override any of the user's important rules. So you have to figure out that sort of stuff. Like font, you know, if I need to have something in large font, then I don't want the authors, authors overriding all that one. For me. So it can be, um, some styles are vital for the user to be able to read a page. Um, any important rules will override normal rules, so authors are advised to use the normal rules exclusively to ensure readers, readers with special style needs are able to read the page. Really, really crucial. An easy priority rule, when two rules have the same weight, the last rule wins. A little bit about layout. Okay? We've seen lots of styling up until now, but I haven't really seen much about layout. And you can use layout, and you'll certainly need to do it in your labs. And I'll talk a little bit about layout in the next lecture. Um, but um, the display property is really one of the most important properties uh, for CSS for controlling layout. And it specifies how an element's displayed. We do that in the next lecture. Okay. Every element has a default display value in terms of what the element is. And the default value for most elements is block or inline. So a block level element always starts on a new line, takes up the full width of the, the page, stretches to the right and left as far as it possibly can. And inline elements don't start in a new line and they only take up as much space as necessary. But what's interesting is that we can change the rules and the behavior of an element by changing the display properties to be block or anything. Kind of fun. 
that's how we can get all sorts of nice tricks and nice displays. We also have a display none, and you often see that with JavaScript, hide and show elements without deleting or recreating them. And we use a script, for example, the script element uses display none as default, so we won't see any, any JavaScript. That we Every element has this display value. You can override it. Um, a common thing to do is to actually change inline li or list elements for horizontal menus. And there's a nice example in W here. Setting the property only changes how the element is displayed. It doesn't change what kind of property or, or element it is. So an inline element with display block is not allowed to have other block elements inside it. It's still an inline element. It's just how it's displayed. Well, these are important issues that you have to become familiar with when you start building up user interfaces with CSS. That's it for today. There's a lot in it, um, and it's uh, tough stuff, tough going. Um, uh, you may need to revisit this at some point, um, some of its detailed um, tomorrow's lectures, or the, late, today, the later one today, the next lecture, um, that talks a little bit more about layout and position. And um, there are the five short 10, 10 minute lessons. So, and there's lots of examples. I have all of the, all of the files will be available for you. So there are lots of demos. All the markdowns are here as well. So you should be able to copy and paste and use them, okay? Thanks, guys. Um, and and uh, some of it's dense, I know. Um, and I appreciate you hanging on. It's a good lot of you still here. And uh, I'll see you in the lab. Um, have a good day. Bye-bye. Thank you very much for attending.